This is Professor Melanie Hildebrandt uh, with a brief lecture on what is economics uh, from the material covered in Chapter 1 of the Microeconomics text. Starting out with uh, some basic definitions here, economics is a social science. So what we're trying to do is study people and how they make choices giving all of the options that are available to them. Specifically, we're studying how people are going to use the limited resources that they have available to satisfy their unlimited wants. And we call this the main economic problem. Individuals have unlimited wants and desires, but our resources are scarce. That means there's not enough. When we say that people have unlimited wants, it doesn't necessarily mean you want more of everything. I can certainly think of things that I don't want to have more of ever. Um, like coconuts. I don't like the way coconuts taste. I'll never want more coconuts. But what it does mean is that everyone wants more of at least one thing. Again, the idea of scarcity uh, shows how limited the resources are. And resources are needed to produce the goods and services that people want. So because resources are scarce, goods and services are scarce, meaning that there's not enough to satisfy everyone's unlimited wants. We have two main subfields of economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Many of you may have already taken macroeconomics um, with me in previous years or with other professors. This course will focus specifically on microeconomics. In microeconomics, we're looking at behavior in particular markets. Think of it like a scientist who's studying something under a microscope, something that's relatively small. So here we're considering individuals' choices, the smaller pieces of a larger puzzle. Some examples would be college students' demand for pizza, or maybe the salary that's earned by nurses in a hospital. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, is the study of the entire economic system. So we're looking at the bigger picture, that bigger puzzle. How does everything in the economy work together? And so in a macro course, you'll study things like inflation, the rise of average prices, growth, which will be talked about more in the PPF lecture, uh, the level of employment, and ideas like worker productivity. Let's look at a few examples here and see if you can determine whether this is a macro or a micro topic. We'll start with A. The national savings rate is less than 2%. And this is not a made-up figure. This is actually uh, the average for the United States. Since we see the word national, that should give you a hint that this is macro, the bigger picture. B, the government passes a job bill designed to stabilize the economy during a recession. Again, because this is on a more national level, this would again be a macro topic. Example C, Apple decides to open 100 new stores in the United States. While Apple is a very large corporation that has a lot of influence on different economies, because we're only looking at one firm's action, we would actually consider this a micro topic. In example D, Jim was laid off from his last job and he is currently unemployed. Again, we're looking at one individual and therefore this would be a micro topic. There are five uh, basic foundations of economics. Uh, many of these we will cover in more detail in further chapters. The idea of incentives. Everything involves incentives. What are the things that motivate you? Why did you choose option A over option B? I have a daughter who's five years old, and trust me, incentives are involved in lots of decisions every day in our lives. Number two, the idea of trade-offs, again, due to scarcity, the fact that we don't have enough resources to fulfill our unlimited wants. Every decision that we make has a cost. If you take the five minutes to listen to this lecture, you're giving up five minutes that you could be eating, sleeping, working, exercising. So trade-offs also are present in our daily activities. Opportunity cost, what we are giving up when we make those decisions, that cost Okay, that is, uh, we call that an opportunity cost. And so if you choose to spend 
four hours this weekend sitting by a pool. You've given up four hours that you could have been earning money working as a waitress. And so the opportunity cost of your decision in that case would be the income you did not earn because you went to the pool instead. Marginal thinking. Um, marginal just means additional or incremental. And so when we'll talk a lot about marginal benefit. What's the additional benefit when I made that decision? Or marginal cost. What's the additional cost related to that? And lastly, the idea that trade creates value. We'll spend a lot of time looking at markets um, and trade and comparative advantage in one of the next chapters. Just some basic definitions that we need to know. Hopefully we already understand most of these. Uh, we use our resources to produce goods and services. Goods are going to be physical products like a hamburger, a pencil, a cell phone. While services are things that we can't see, okay, so if you go and spend 15 minutes with an academic advisor, a service was performed. If you take your taxes uh, and have an accountant prepare them for you, you are paying for a service. Markets then bring our buyers and sellers together so that exchange can happen. We have two kind of general types of markets, the product market where goods and services are bought and sold, and then the resource market where the resources that make those goods and services are bought and sold. And let's look a little closer um, at our resources. You'll see a lot of different terms used interchangeably for these inputs, factors of production. They're just things that we need to produce goods and services. We have four main resource types. The first is labor. This is the physical and mental effort of our people, of all the individuals in our economy to produce goods and services. And our laborers earn a payment type which we call a wage. You're probably fairly familiar um, with this category. Next, let's talk about natural resources. Everything that we get from the outside that helps us produce goods and services. Water, air, minerals, oil, trees. Okay, those are natural resources. Natural resources can be renewable. Think of uh, trees that we need for wood and for paper products. We can cut down acres and acres of trees, but we'll eventually have more trees as long as we replant. On the other hand, some natural resources are exhaustible, um, which is the view of our oil. And there's a certain amount, finite amount underneath the earth. Once it's gone, it's gone. Your payment type for natural resources is called rent. The third category is capital. When an economist says capital, we're not talking financial capital um, like money or stocks or bonds. When we say capital, we're talking about uh, physical and human capital. Okay, physical capital are buildings, equipments, computers, anything that is produced to then help us produce other things. Uh, human capital are the skills, experiences, and education of our laborers that help them be more productive workers. And the payment type is interest. Lastly, entrepreneurial ability or enterprise. It's the risk taking and the coordination of these other three types of resources to produce the final goods and services. And the payment there would be profit.